the um, discussion on uh, the transition from a linear economy to a circular economy and about that, what that exactly entails. We'll uh, find out this afternoon. We hope to give you a nice interview, uh, uh, overview of that and an interesting discussion. A special welcome actually to um, Congressman Paul Tomko. Uh, you've seen in the program that also uh, Congressman uh, Matt Cartwright uh, is supposed to speak. He has not arrived yet, um, but we have indication that he will arrive later on in the program. And of course also welcome to the uh, Ambassador of the Netherlands, Mr. Hennis Schuwer. Um, the circular economy actually is high on the agenda, uh, not only with uh, businesses that are making a transition to circular business models, but also on the political agenda. In Europe uh, and in the Netherlands, the Netherlands presidency, which was the first half of this year, paid special attention to the circular economy. We had an event in Washington in February, and actually it was Congressman Tonko that then said, why don't you bring this message to the Hill? And that's what we're doing today. Um, you may have seen our little program for today. Um, we'll first have introductory remarks by um, Ambassador Schumer, and then uh, that is followed by uh, introductory remarks by uh, Congressman Tomko, and if he arrives on time, also Mr. Cartwright. If he's not here on time, we'll start the discussion, which is going to be moderated by Kevin Moss from the World Resources Institute, uh, and then we'll hold the discussion when uh, Congressman Cartwright arrives. Kevin later on will um, introduce all the panelists over here. We have a nice mix of uh, American and foreign companies, big and small, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Mr. Ambassador, may I invite you to the interview? Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Hennis Schuur. I'm the Ambassador of the Netherlands. Thank you very much to all of you here for coming. Thank you very much for all of you here for for staying after you had your sandwich. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that, that's an extra incentive. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, a very uh, warm welcome to uh, Paul Tonko, uh, a friend of the embassy. Uh, he was there at the event uh, in February. It was his idea to come here. I must say the event in February had the view. Uh, we have the power uh, here, let's hope so. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to, as they say, give introductory remarks. Introductory remarks are short, and introductory remarks are given by somebody who tries to hide the ignorance that he has on the subject, so uh, I, will, uh, I will do my do my best. But first of all, uh, I'm very glad that there are so many people, which means that uh, the circular economy lives, the concept lives, uh, and I think that's very, very important for us and for all the people who are not here uh, for around the world, because as we all know, we have a limited amount of resources and we have a growing uh, number of people and everybody knows, everybody who can think rationally knows that at one point in time these two curves will collide and then it goes on. Uh, and we have now <coughs> the opportunity to change the course of our economy from a linear to a circular economy and make sure that these two things, the limited number of resources and the growing amount of people will never meet and will have a sustainable and a livable uh, world uh, for our generations to come. And that's what this is uh, about. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I know that you've been very busy. And, uh, welcome to what you almost want to say is, is a little family. Uh, of people uh, who believe in the circular economy, and it's great that we uh, have you here uh, for, for, uh, for afterwards. Um, it's very important uh, to, to invest uh, in the circular economy, uh, and we have done so in the Netherlands for quite some time, and I think for, for two very typical Dutch reasons. Uh, we in the Netherlands below sea level, you know it all, uh, densely populated, space size of Maryland, too many people, and we need something for a circular economy, uh, because otherwise, in any case in the Netherlands, we will we'll lead a very unhappy life. Uh, but secondly, and that's the other nice thing, 
is we found out that you can make money with the circular economy. And so you, you basically married the two, uh, almost in the political context uh, where we divide the world between left and right. The right makes money, the left thinks about the environment. You can marry the two, you can be left and right uh, on the circular economy uh, and both sides have a very good reason uh, to be supportive of the circular economy. Um, what governments uh, can do, uh, and what governments do, is legislation. Uh, and what governments do is basically creating incentives for companies to be participants in the circular economy. And that's exactly what the Netherlands government has tried to do. And we had the golden opportunity the last half a year we were president of uh, the EU, uh, and uh, we set out to do as much as possible in an EU context to set the EU <coughs> on the road to circular economy. And I'm very proud that I think that we didn't accomplish all of our agenda, but we accomplished quite a number of things. And I want to give you some figures because in itself they are interested, interesting, and they might be an example for other places in the world. Um, we set out, uh, we adopted legislative proposals to recycle 65% of our municipal waste and 17% of our packaging waste by 2030. That's a rule. That's what we're going to do as Europe by 2030. We also set out as a Europe to have a, bending, uh, of a binding landfill target to reduce landfill to a maximum of 10%. Uh, of mun municipal waste. No more than 10% of our municipal waste will end up in landfills. Uh, these are examples of what we accomplished within our EU presidency and I think on the road to a circular economy. In the Netherlands, we have done also a number of things, which is a longer lasting program that we date from well before our EU presidencies uh, uh, on, on what we call the Green Deal. It's a deal between the government and, uh, and, and the private enterprise. Let's make a deal together and let's try to tackle some of the most difficult problems. I think one of the wonderful examples there is our national railway system. Everybody takes the train in the morning uh, in the Netherlands and leaves, and leaves a, lot of, a lot of waste in the train. We make a deal with the national railway system that together we will pick up the waste recycle the waste and therefore it was a big deal for uh, for our railway system it's a big deal for us because it's a lot of waste that's being left in trains and like that you can work together government and private uh, enterprise to make a step towards uh, what we call the green deal towards a circular uh, e e economy um, we have a lot of companies uh, in the netherlands who are now busy on circular economy because it's um, the part of them are real startups, uh, people who see, you know, what there is an opportunity here. I am an entrepreneur. I can uh, be busy in the circular economy. Part of it are big companies. Also, our bigger companies, our our our, our DSMs, our Philips, uh, the big companies have basically got it. Uh, this is something there where we can make uh, make money, and this is something where we can contribute to a better, in this case, the Netherlands, as what we have, what we have now. So um, you will have to find in this room uh, representatives of those companies. You will find in the panel representatives, not only of Dutch companies, but from Australia to, to the US, to the Netherlands, all kinds of people who basically have found that the circular economy is a business uh, proposal. And that's, one, that's what we wanted to show you here uh, to, to, uh, to a day. Uh, it's beneficial to invest in the circular economy, not only for your business acumen, but also for your children and your grandchildren and for the planet as a whole. And if there's something that we can explain about that in this hour that we have together, I will be very, very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, may I first uh, ask uh, Ms. Tonko to deliver his opening remarks?
Thank you, uh, Councillor Tijong, and it's an honor to join with you and Ambassador Schuert, Julie, and all so many that have uh, worked on this concept of bringing uh, great minds, green minds together and talk about uh, a trash to treasure circular economy concept, which uh, is wonderful. And it's great to join with my uh, colleague, Matt Cartwright, who uh, is from a neighboring state in Pennsylvania, but we're uh, fellow members of SEEK, the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. And we're similar thinkers on those issues, on uh, many, many issues. And uh, one thing about Matt is he's never short of ideas, and he's always full of energy to make things happen. So, uh, Matt, we appreciate that. But Ambassador, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I think it's so great to uh, be able to respond in a way that brings people together to cluster and engage in the, uh, the efforts of sustainability, resourcefulness, re-engineering, certainly, and recycling, all of those concepts of which can uh, really speak to a growth of the economy. And to all the panelists, we look forward to listening to you and your uh, new thinking, your new order of thinking that will, I'm certain, inspire us and move us forward. And to all the folks of the Dutch Embassy, thank you for being such good partners in, uh, in a sustainable economy. I'm grateful also to Netherlands uh, for using its pulpit as president of the EU, as was mentioned by the ambassador, to make certain that a circular, er, circular economy becomes indeed a high priority uh, within the European Union and uh, impacting that to uh, nations around the world. There certainly are some lessons that we can learn from the regulatory package that they have been advancing. I think they're leading, certainly by example, strong example. Um, and as members of the SEEK organization in our house, we represent about 53, 54 voices, as I was reminded this morning. Uh, we're a growing number of members who are green dogs in a way, who uh, advance green policies and understand fully and promote fully the fact that uh, thinking green, being innovative, being resourceful, being uh, a sound steward of the environment does not mean you deny jobs, it means you grow jobs, you connect jobs, many times of a new order, so uh, it's exciting. We all know our global population is indeed growing. As I was reminded last night that one of eight people that are um, living on this planet today um, are, um, what, what was it, one of eight that live on this planet today are uh, the grow fastest number growing in this population in the world. And uh, the population that we have is extremely large and convincing people that many ideas have to be changed and done in a way that's innovative and uh, out of the box thinking, if not out of the barrel. Many developing nations have a burgeoning middle class that want and expect a higher standard of living, and that includes significantly increased consumption. There is widespread recognition and acceptance that resource scarcity will be a major challenge for the United States and the world during this century. And as we deal with the effects of climate change, which is real in my mind, it will only get worse in the centuries to come. We're dealing with finite supplies, finite supplies of energy, finite supplies of water, and certainly of other precious resources. Many of our current practices simply just cannot last. The business as usual scenario simply won't be uh, possible. A change to a more circular economy is inevitable. And beginning that transition now with sound planning and a direct focus will be easier than forced uh, into a change later without having planned that change uh, adequately. This switch won't be easy. There will be big challenges. Change is not easy. But it starts with the change of mindset. We also need to recognize the opportunities that we have before us. We are a nation of pioneers, and pioneers will be the ones that reap the rewards of embracing these challenges first. And as a nation of pioneers, we partner with other nations that have that pioneer spirit around the world that will enable us to provide for this sustainable outcome. The tremendous economic benefits and opportunities by adopting sustainable business practices and inventing new sustainable products. And the federal government has a role in this nation to play in helping to support companies that want to invest in innovative research and in business practices that will keep us on the cutting edge. So I thank our participants from the private sector for sharing their stories today and how they are embracing this circular business model and discovering new business opportunities. This sort of mindset, as I said, 
will ignite, I think, a new order of economy, one that will advance sound thinking and that will show a respect for generations to come, generations unborn. I hope the message we will hear today is one that adapts to tomorrow's challenges and growing today's bottom lines as uh, inherently a sound agenda. Profitable businesses and innovative thinking and investments can and have always gone hand in hand. And since this is a Dutch event, um, I want to emphasize that we also need to think about moving toward a bluer economy. Americans are only now beginning to understand what the Dutch have known for centuries. Water is critical to our nation's economy. Water is critical to our public health. Um, we have said so many times over in the last year, water is part of every life, water is part of every job. We all learned about the water cycle in elementary school, and not only is water's natural reuse a model for a circular economy, it must be a centerpiece. Water will certainly be one of, if not the most, critical commodity in the future. And so I hope we can think about how we can use this resource more efficiently and invest in the infrastructure necessary to make a greater efficient, efficiency a possibility. We need every stakeholder, from government to private sector to uh, non-government uh, non organizations, to come together to embrace the principles and tra tra uh, transitions to a circular economy. So again, I thank all those who conceived of this opportunity. Thank you for bringing it to the Hill. You know, when we talked about it, I thought, well, we'll get some interest. But this is an overwhelming response, one of which you should be most proud. So again, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to our Dutch host, Mr. Dijon, and certainly to Julie and all who've worked on this effort in such a steadfast way, bringing together ideas, bringing together like minds, and bringing together people who are those agents of reform and change is a sound idea. Let's move forward and grow this economy in a unique way, one that will enable us to look back and say, it started on the hill with the Dutch influence. So thank you so much. Have a great conversation. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for your inspiring words. Uh, Congressman Cartwright also has arrived in the meantime. Welcome to you uh, as well. And Thank you for having me here today uh, to discuss important topics that don't get enough attention. It's an honor for me to follow uh, Representative Paul Tonko, uh, my friend and colleague. Uh, he's been a, a true leader in the Congress. He's been a mentor to me. Um, I think it's only appropriate uh, that uh, at a Dutch event, Paul Tonko speak because he has Rotterdam in his district. He has Amsterdam in his district. He has Waterville in his district, uh, and uh, a, 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 a really an ancestral home for, for Dutch in America, uh, in the, the capital region of New York State. Uh, but more than that, Paul Tonko has been a, a driving force behind the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, the Sheik Caucus, uh, that he mentioned as. Uh, I think we're at 53 members. Uh, dues paying, I'm not sure. We have to go back and, and check. But uh, I'm so proud to be a, 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 a vice chair of the SEEK caucus. Uh, Paul Tonko is one of the co-chairs. Um, we are a band of uh, committed environmentalists uh, and people committed to sustainable energy and renewable energy practices. Uh, and, uh, and Paul Tonko deserves to be one of the co-chairs of that. He is a visionary in promoting clean energy innovation, uh, the development of renewable energy re resources, creation of new quality green jobs. I don't know if I call myself a green dog, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm, a, uh, I'm a supporter. Hosting a, a forum such as this is just another great example of the leadership and ingenuity that Congressman Tonko brings, and I often brag about him, uh, his engineering background. Now, we have a number of engineers in the SEEK caucus, practical, uh, pragmatic-minded uh, members of Congress who, who want to roll up their sleeves and get the job done. Uh, you know, not, uh, not the, uh, you know, the prototypical uh, tree-hugger crowd that you might imagine. Uh, we, want to, we want to see practical solutions implemented. Uh, 
to do things like combat climate change. You know, I spend a lot of time in the, the Natural Resources Committee talking about climate change. Uh, and Holland, and, and after all, sea level rise is such a big element of climate change, and how much money is spent in the Netherlands on combating sea level rise, uh, and that's something that has to be talked about because that's what you have to, you know, pay me now or pay me later uh, when we talk about climate change. And as population <laughs> increases and stress is put on our natural resources, our global markets, today's, cust today's companies or customers and legislators have to be even more aware of what needs to be done to sustain ourselves into the future. It goes well beyond recycling, and it will not be an easy transition, but it is a necessary one. Let me paint a picture. Fast forward 20 years in a circular economy model. Landfills are becoming obsolete. Market-based incentives have been implemented on a large and harmonized scale. Companies no longer pay for trash collection. They get paid for their trash. Waste has intrinsic value as a resource. It's a future where the theory of the circular economy thrives, but how do we get there? I applaud the Netherlands for announcing its ambitious commitment to becoming a global hotspot for the circular economy and making this one of its key priorities for leadership in the EU, from exporting top sectors eco innovation to supporting individualized smaller developments through the Green Deals program. They have produced rapid results. Following the Green Deals program enactment, the Dutch government signed 130 Green Deals in just six months. The projects range from bolstering its natural sea barriers to building a movable dam and have successfully made the Netherlands a technological and social leader in the field, an area that we here in the United States uh, can certainly take a lesson from. The United States has a similar an entrepreneurial spirit, a business acumen, and ability to innovate that we can capitalize on to move away from this take-make-waste linear industrial model. Resources are integral to everything we do. Americans are learning that preservation is the key to progress, but we're not learning fast enough. In my district in northeastern Pennsylvania, trash has been a significant problem. While we can manage our own trash, our region has become a disposal ground from our friends in New Jersey, for example. Um, and I believe that we can deal with trash better and help incentivize our citizens to reduce their waste. That's why just this week I am introducing the House Companion to what Senator Bob Casey introduced as the Trash Act, which would allow states to reject the importation of trash from other states that don't live up to the standards for recycling and proper trash handling in their own states. It's a wonderful idea, and I commend Senator Bob Casey for it, and I'm proud to introduce the House version of it this week. Folks, a circular business model provides an additional way to address this trash problem and also speaks to the scarcity of fossil fuels, raw materials, and fresh water. I've been, I've been focused on encouraging sustainability of those elements for a long time. Uh, this Congress, I introduced three energy efficiency bills to assist nonprofits, schools, and manufacturing facilities in reducing their energy footprints. As you're all aware, we have a long way to go. Today, less than 25% of the collected plastic waste is recycled, and about 50% still goes to the landfill. We can minimize this waste of energy and materials through sustainable buildings, innovative infrastructure, renewable energy, and new revolutionary designs, and all of these things are job creators. Now, Paul Tonko and I were at a dinner last night, and I started to, to refer to that. It was a, a dinner about uh, the spread of Zika and the coming yellow fever uh, pandemic. Uh, and that is spread by mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes uh, are born in small pockets of water that collect in bits of plastic. And solving things like the Zika problem, 
the coming yellow fever problem. Uh, are, they're all connected with solving the trash problem. Um, and a big part of the, the, the challenge is the number of people who live on the earth today. Uh, uh, Representative Tonko referred to the one-eighth figure, and what that is is of all of the people who have ever lived, only one-eighth of them are, on, are alive today in the earth. So we have an enormous amount of people generating an enormous amount of trash, uh, and it's, uh, it's not just about keeping the landscape pretty, it's about keeping ourselves safe. I know I'm preaching to the converted when I say we need to make this transition to a circular economy, but among you there are various views on how that is to be done. Today is about sharing ideas and finding creative ways to redefine and modernize our economy, so let's work together toward the future toward that picture 20 years from now that I painted. I look forward to a productive and enlightening discussion. And again, I thank you all for being here. And Ambassador, thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Van Wright. Um, what I actually liked uh, most in all of your opening remarks is um, that first, what is needed to achieve a transition from a linear to a circular economy is a shift in mindset. I think that's absolutely crucial. And then also, that is, this is not a tree head huggers exercise. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, the, making the transition to a circular economy can be a very profitable business. We're going to hear about that later in the panel discussion. And of course, uh, apart from uh, uh, a uh, task that is there for legislators also, they should uh, create a proper framework to make uh, all these uh, transitions possible. Um, profitable business, we're going to have a discussion with uh, a number of panelists. Um, uh, Kevin Moss of the World Resources Institute. He is uh, a director for global, international, uh, global business, for whatever. He is director with WRI. <laughs> it's, it's in your program. Uh, and Kevin actually is going to moderate. Kevin, of course. Thank you very much. And um, um, let me say, Ambassador Shua, Congressman Tonko, Congressman Cartwright, thank you for your remarks to kick the event off today and provide us with a framework for the conversation. Um, I'm Kevin Moss, I'm with WRI. It's amazing seeing such a full room. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, I'm with WRI, the World Resources Institute. We're based just across on the other side of Union Station. Um, we are a research and analysis organization that puts ideas into action. Our three-word approach is count it, change it, scale it. And today is really exciting for me to be a part of because we scale it through working with government and we scale it through working with business and we scale it even more through business and government working together. So this is a really great event for me to have business here at the seat of government in the US working together um, and sharing ideas. Um, but as the moderator, today's not about me or my organization, I just can't resist a couple of words about it. Um, I head up the business program at WRI, um, and so I was um, asked, and thank you very much for asking me to, to uh, moderate this panel. Um, thank you to all our panelists who have patiently sat here at the front um, awaiting their turn. My job for the next half hour or so is to make sure everybody gets their turn to speak. That means I'm going to have to be a pretty strict moderator, um, and I'm going to do my best to, that, to do that, and to also leave you all some time to ask questions um, at the end. Um, we have a range of businesses here. We have large and small businesses. We have American and European businesses. We have some businesses that you might think of as traditional, but I think they're going to show you today that, as Congressman Tonko mentioned, they are pioneers as well. And we have businesses that are very much disruptive. Um, and we're going to, each one is going to give us a few words about what they're doing, what their interpretation is of circular economy, um, and I'm going to introduce them individually as, as their turn comes up. So we're going to start with Dow Chemical Company and Eunice Heath. Eunice is the Global Director of Sustainability at Dow. I'd like to just pull one thing. You have everybody's bios under your seats or with, with your papers. I'd like to just pull one thing out for each person. And something I just want to point out from you, for Eunice is Eunice has come, and we're seeing this increasingly in the sustainability world from a mainstream business background in product management, marketing, sales, brand management, 
I hope I have this right, and you'll correct me if I haven't, but from your, from your bio, we're seeing that increasingly, which I think is a great society, sign for sustainability and circular economy, that people are coming in from mainstream business backgrounds. So Eunice, over to you first, um, and somebody looking after slides for us? Let me know if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, we're very pleased to uh, be here today and to share with you what advancing the circular economy is for Dow. Uh, so if you'll go to the Dow at a glance slide, uh, what I wanted to do is pro provide you with a perspective of who we are and why advancing the circular economy is important to us. We are a global enterprise. We have uh, technologies that that are manufactured in over 180, or around 180 manufacturing sites around the world. Um, we have technologies that are very diverse um, in terms of the types of products in our portfolio, as well as the various applications which they are used in. When you think about the products that you use every day, that are manufactured every day, about 90, it's about 95% requires uh, chemistry and material science, and we are a world leader in chemistry and material science. So we view that it is our responsibility and certainly our commitment to enable and help the transformation from a linear economy to a circular economy. So if you'll go to the next slide, our sustainability journey has spanned over the course of the past uh, 20 years, certainly well before that, but formalized about 20 years ago when we really address our own footprint of our operations as well as environmental health and safety for our employees and operations. Then it moved into the second stage of our journey in terms of our handprint, that's technology, that's innovation, really addressing many of the world challenges, whether it's water, energy, uh, automotive, um, a number of different uh, various applications, food uh, applications as well, just to name a few. And now we're embarked upon our new goals, which circular economy is one of the seven uh, goals in our 2025 sustainability uh, strategy. And really, this is a, a place where uh, these particular goals connects policy, uh, value chain, as well as innovation and collaboration across the board uh, as we move ourselves towards a more sustainable society. So what is a circular economy? A circular economy for Dow is keeping our resources at their highest value throughout their life cycles. It's really about maximizing our resources. We look at it from a system redesign perspective, innovation, collaboration. Collaboration is key. Uh, collaboration as it pertains to internally as we address our own operations, but also as we work with our customers um, and many different value chains in terms of their operations. Innovation, how do you design in for circularity? And then end of use. End of use for us, uh, as we look at our plastics and packaging business, we're the world largest of plastics and uh, packaging uh, resins and adhesives for the food packaging market as an example. And we know that it is our commitment and our responsibility to be a part of the solution in terms of addressing a lot of what you just heard a few moments ago with regards to the pollution that we have um, in our oceans or uh, as well as addressing uh, redesigning our packaging as we move forward. So technology is a key enabler to a circular economy. So this slide is taken from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We are a member of the CE100, and for now, we are addressing uh, circular economy solutions from the very beginning of the cycle, from a renewables uh, perspective. We are now the, the largest industrial user of clean energy, uh, as of a couple months ago, uh, with our investment in wind energy. On the biological side, our water business, and enabling uh, the ability to use a uh, one, uh, one water one water cycle. And then on the technical side, as we look at a number of different solutions for remanufacturing, reusing, recycling as well. So if you go to the example slide, this particular slide, I want to give you a perspective. You heard uh, the, the comments from uh, Mr. Ambassador with regards to the Green Deal. We are very proud as Dow to uh, be one of the companies to have signed on and partnered with, uh, with the Netherlands in terms of some Green Deal opportunities here. Uh, our Dow Benelux has been active with uh, the Dutch and National Energy Dialogue and has contributed to the development of the 2050 indus industry agenda. And under the Smart Delta Resources platform, this is where the Green Deal is. We are uh, partnered with the government with seven other parties, uh, which delivers high quality applications for hydrogen release of Dow's cracker plants that are in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, so when we look at uh, innovations in terms of, in terms of circular economy, uh, they span from operational excellence like the one I just gave you that is, in, in, that is embedded in the Green Deal, all the way to the packaging side, which is innovation of redesigning 
the polymers that enable us to recycle more products, uh, more packaging uh, as it gets into the use phase, uh, which requires different types of partnerships than we've ever had before. Uh, partnerships that enable collaboration towards um, in engaging and educating the consumer on how to recycle label as example with the sustainable packaging coalition and then the bottom left you've got you know we've got a new and a different business model that enables the solvent recovery in a closed loop system for those types of applications that require solvents and then if we talk about the water side you'll go to the very last slide our water business as we look at the advancing of a water circular economy this is where we're addressing not only efficiency, not only reuse and recycle, but also the ability to use alternative sources. And so the Dow Ternuza Netherlands site is our second largest manufacturing site outside of the U.S. So we've got 180 manufacturing sites. That's our second largest. And as we partnered with uh, the municipality there, our key, key focus here is to eliminate the reliance of fresh water. Uh, this is a partnership that is a breakthrough public-private partnership where water is not only used what reused once, but reused three times, and it minimizes and, and maximizes actually uh, the uh, opportunity for uh, agriculture, uh, municipal use, uh, while we also continue to invest in innovation and growth at this site. So thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to the questions that you may have uh, with regards to our approach to the circular economy. Eunice, thank you. I'm I'm just going to ask you one question. Um, could you talk a little bit about with inside, inside the business, so you're on the sustainability side, inside the business, do people see this as doing good and um, being good for the environment, or is this part of the way people are thinking about doing business? That's a very good question. Uh, for Dow, sustainability is about good business. It is good business. It's a part of our business strategy. Um, and when we look from across the organization, from operations, all the way to those that are designing, those that are in sales and marketing, it's all about ensuring that we understand what the challenges are uh, with our customers and the value chains, where we need to partner in order for us to enable the change, enable the impact, and it's good business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eunice, thank you very much. I'm going to move on now to Joost Bochelman. Did I do that okay, Joost? Jos Bochelman, who is Vice President of Business Development at um, Inashco, which has the main, one of the main products in the name of the company. Um, Jos, I just want to pull one thing out from your bio that I found fascinating. You have a background in the Merchant Navy, um, which I just different. We don't normally see that on, on, um, on business panels. <laughs> So thank you for joining us. Thank you for moving from the Merchant Navy into the private sector. And you're going to tell us a little bit about what Inashco does within the circular economy environment. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, dear Congressman, Ambassador, organization, but especially the audience, thank you for allowing me a few minutes to, of your time and to tell a little bit about the activities of Inashco. When you look at this picture, it's not as sexy as an electric car or hydropower. But sometimes, where you don't expect it, like in the residual streams, you can do so much. And I want to share a little bit of my passion regarding this topic. Because, on an annual basis, within the US, about 7.5 to 8 million tons of waste to energy ash is being landfilled. And we, as UNESCO, are convinced that there are too many valuable metals and minerals being included and wasted in this way, and we would like to reuse them. So, on the next slide, you will see our storyline, which all begins with the 77 waste or energy facilities in the U.S., which burn your household trash, convert it into energy, produce power, green power, but also a residual ash stream. And we, with our in-house proprietary equipment, process this ash to get those metals out and clean up the ash to such a maximum extent that even the minerals could be reused for any beneficial purposes. The products you can see over here, which we take out, larger non-ferrous pieces, soda cans and peas, smaller fine non-ferrous, ultra fine non-ferrous, so the smallest particles we want to take out, and really show you how clean minerals can be uh, at the end of our process. Our clients are off-takers, which smelt the copper, aluminum, lead and zinc into virgin materials, with much less of a carbon footprint, and reuse the minerals into concrete or cement products. So on the next slide, you can see roughly the big scheme of things within the US, what can you do with municipal solid waste called garbage. You can bring it directly to a landfill where the decay will produce methane, a very strong greenhouse gas, 
uh, you will have the 100% uh, tonnage in a, in a landfill with a, negative, of a, a positive carbon footprint contributing. You can also recycle part of it, like a assumable 35%, and bring the remainder to a landfill. Less tonnage, less carbon footprint. The third option, and those are our clients with the waste to energy facilities, which incinerate the trash which cannot be recycled anymore. So it's after recycling, where it's not economic or sustainable to recycle it. Which incinerate these flows, producing this flow of ash, which can end up in a landfill. And this is where our storyline begins. We are passionate about recycling as much as we can from this ash stream. We have our own equipment where we try to reduce this 70% further to, let's assume, a 5%. And even create a negative carbon footprint. So reduce less greenhouse gases which would have occurred if you would have put it into a landfill. We do this by taking out ferrous metals, non-ferrous metals, and mineral aggregates. And we at this moment have a 14% market share, but we want to do more. On the next slide, I would like to end with a few conclusions. Ash recycling. Uh, ash recycling leads to less landfilling, less uh, CO2 emissions, and it makes the waste to energy economy work, the economics. So this extra financial impulse can stimulate waste to energy. The perfect world would be stronger federal legislation, but assume that might be too far-fetched at this moment. So let's aim a little bit more simple at public education on waste to energy and ash recycling, streamlining on the permitting process and amend regulations so we can make our business work, consider the whole full value chain of MSW, thus incorporating all the costs associated with landfill and thus maybe increasing part of the taxes, but incentivize us with recycling subsidies. The key conclusion for us is that ash recycling is the missing puzzle piece for a maximum responsible waste to energy process for the non-recyclable waste stream all contributing to the circular economy we're discussing today and bringing back not only by our clients the power, but us bringing minerals and metals clean for good use back into the loop. Thank you. Niels, thank, thank you very much. And I know for all of you, these businesses are what you spend day in, day out working on, and we're sort of pressing you to say it in four or five minutes. So I appreciate you doing that and how hard it is. Um, if I could just ask you one question, um, you, you referred there to some of the regulation. Are there places in the world this is easier for you to do, and places in the world this is harder? And any lessons we can learn from that on how government can help um, build a circular economy? Yeah, I will be very modest, because from a Dutch background, uh, explaining here which countries do best is difficult. <laughs> Although I'm a Dutchman, and I'm close to the Dutch politics. I believe that initiatives such as the Green Deal, such a close co cooperation between government, private sector, but also research and universities, does work very nicely. So really, if it could lead to such a Green Deal principle over here in the US, I really believe uh, not in enforcing, but I believe in triggering, teasing, and just working together, and that is possible. Yes, thank you very much. We are going to carry on moving around the world um, Yels talks about ash not being a sexy product. We're moving to diapers now. <laughs> Jason, Jason, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pull. I'm just going to pull out of your bio that that within one one paragraph you managed to prove you are bilingual using the word diapers and nappies at the very beginning and the very end. I appreciate the use of the word nappies. I didn't actually know what the product was till I got to the. <laughs> So, so Jason Graham, who's a co-founder, a co-founder of G, G Diapers, I'm going to let you come up and watch from there wherever you prefer and tell us about it. Thank you, Ambassador and Congressman and everybody. Thanks for having me. As you can tell from my accent, I come a long way south of the soon-to-be-built border, um, Australia. <laughs> I don't quite know what time zone I'm on, so bear with me. Um, so. These are some devastating statistics around diapers that shocked my wife and I 13 years ago when we had a son. We weren't very sustainable, but we learned those massive numbers that you can read quicker than I can read out. But it's quite extraordinary if you think about a cup of oil, a non-renewable resource, going into a product that's used by just 5% of the population for two to three hours at a time, and then it gets put back in the ground where it stays for 500 years. The focus here is babies. 
the next thing for us is in fact aged care. So much to look forward to. One of our taglines was, it's the first and last product you'll ever wear. Kind of grim. <laughs> so moving on. <laughs> so, I, I wanted to share with you, those statistics blew our mind and we found a product in Tasmania. Interesting, flushable, compostable baby diaper. We bought the rights to the rest of the world, moved to Portland, Oregon 10 years ago and launched G Diapers. It's a B2C business, we sell to consumers. Classic green product, 10-15% more expensive than the usual product. So not going to do it for us in terms of we need to get our price down and we're frustrated. So for five years back in Australia, we started this project called G-Cycle. So a new product, patented diapers and wipes that we deliver to childcare centres uh, every week. Then we collect the diapers, the wipes and all their food waste, which is about 80% of their waste stream. And we compost it off site and then we sell it. So as a business, we have two lines of revenue. We can share that with our childcare centre partners. Um, and other things have emerged. So um, uh, the childcare centre is now a retailer. They sell the product to the, uh, the parents. If you have one child in your house, half your garbage is diapers. So those parents who buy the diapers from the childcare return the diapers to the childcare with their baby. And the waste stream is redirected. I know that sounds really weird, but it's kind of interesting. But from a green product for 10 years going to consumer to now G-Cycle, which is B2B, we've got a situation where the price of the product can be lower than the incumbents, hampers and huggies, which is really where the revolution is when it comes to sustainability. And what I find fascinating is, is when you talk to the CFO of a large chain of childcare or aged care, it's not about saving the planet. They have waste management is a very high cost for them. And, um, we can solve that problem. In terms of, um, this is a, a case study that we, we've been doing in Australia for, um, for four years. You can see the savings in terms of landfill, tons diverted away from landfill, greenhouse gas saved, and tons of compost created. Depending on the market, the, the market for compost is different, but you can see you can generate two lines of revenue. Um, if we sneak to the next one, thanks. So this is interesting, we're, we're, in a, we're Australians, we've got a business in Portland, Oregon, we've got a business in, in London, and this, is what we've learned about doing a circular economy. It's very partner-based. We need to engage with haulers, government, childcare, aged care. And what we found is somewhere like Sydney, where we are, despite not being as tiny as the Netherlands, they've been very proactive in making landfill very expensive. It's ten, and it grows 10% every year. So that this means that our business works in Sydney well. Mm -hmm. Vancouver, BC, zero waste goals. A 95% diversion rate for their administrative building away from landfill, but there's 16 childcare centres, 5% diversion because of the diapers and wipes. So it's, they make it expensive and we have a viable business. London's the same. When we get to the US, it's been really challenging. New York, it's quite cheap. Uh, California, it's quite cheap. New Jersey, in some parts, is about $1.50 a tonne. Um, so it's, it's a challenge for us and uh, I'm really interested to try and get some traction here in the US. Excitedly, excitingly, uh, in New York, there's the Closed Loop Fund. It's an, private fund, the ex-VP of Sustainability at Walmart and the ex-Bloomberg administration guy who did solid waste have come together, they've raised a huge amount of money to do grants and equity investment in the circular economy. So there's things going on in the private sector and we'd love to partner with government to see if we can get some traction in, in New York, in Pennsylvania, in these states to still improve out this model. Um, and last slide, uh, we are a part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, London based big companies along with these fantastic companies, Google, Nike, it's getting traction, it's very real. Cradle to Cradle, we were the first consumer package group to get Cradle to Cradle certification about nine years ago, and we're also a big corporation, which is all about being a triple bottom line company. And I think that's my time. <laughs> Jason, thank you very much. Just let me pull out a couple of themes that I think are really important. One is um, we talk about the importance in sustainability and circular economy of turning a, a product into a service, and you've just given us a great example of turning a product into a service, and I think John's going to do something similar for us in a moment. Um, and also these, the importance of these international contrasts and pricing, I'll put it in my words perhaps, pricing the environment at the cost of the environment makes a bit, turns a business opportunity into a business opportunity for you. Thank, thank you for that. Let me ask you one question. Your customers, are your customers buying these products because they care about the environment, or are your customers buying these products irrespective of what they think about the environment? Um, is that on? Is that on? Is that on? Can I just scroll? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so in the childcare 
the, the, the sort of hierarchy for childcare is, is pretty interesting. Um, they, so we lock them into a three-year deal. So we supply diapers and wipes for three years and that waste management for three years. So we fix their waste cost. So the CFO is excited already. We're getting all the kids out of polypropylene plastic, so it reduces diaper rash. So that's important. Um, and they love the marketing story to, the, to their mums and dads. Um, they generate so much waste, so they want that story. Great. John, thank you very um, much. Sorry, Jason, thank you very much. We're going to move over to John Poland now, who is the Public Sector Account Manager at Philips Electronics. And John, I know, is also going to show us about turning a product into a service. Um, John, just a couple of words. You've moved from government to private sector, which I think is great as well. You've got both, both of those perspectives. Just want to pull out that I noticed both you and Jos have worked for Siemens in the past, so a shout out to Siemens here from two, two of their alumni on, on the panel. And you've also had the misfortune of being on a panel moderated by me before, and you've come back for more, so thank you. I, I enjoy being on a panel where everybody's got an accent. <laughs> <laughs> Note that we used to work for Siemens. Maybe that's saying something. Uh, it's very difficult to follow the diaper story and the trash story, uh, especially if you're a large global corporation like, like Dow. Uh, 125 years ago, we started making these. Uh, they don't look like they last very long, and they didn't. So we made a lot of them over and over and over and over. 125 years. Next. Uh, that's, let's go to the next one. That's... Okay. Lighting manufacturers most went into medical imaging. Think about that. You said, why? Uh, a long time ago, medical imaging was a sophisticated light bulb, the X-ray. So that's why you find Siemens, Philips, GE, all in both lines of business. That, of course, is the, the best. But nonetheless, that is the, uh, an imaging device now that doesn't really involve a light bulb, but it does involve a great deal of cost to both the, the manufacturer of that product. Next. <laughs> now we make lights that last maybe as long as you, you will live. Lights will become uh, Im embedded in structures and they will last as long as that structure is there. Lights will last 10, 20 years. Needless to say, if your business model was making a lot of light bulbs that burned out and now you're making lights that last a lifetime, you have to change your business model. So the circular economy to us is not a concept, it's an imperative, it's, it's a requirement, it's a necessity. Whether it is in our medical imaging equipment or in our light manufacturing, we now are moving to a business model where we are not selling the machine or the object. We're not a manufacturer. We're going to be selling the outcome. We will be selling light. We've done that uh, on our first job here in the garages at the WMATA. Not that you're taking WMATA these days, but if you were and you were parking in a garage, you will notice that the lights will change. They don't own those light fixtures. We do. And as a result, they're just buying the light, the output. Therefore, every opportunity we have to improve the efficiency, the energy efficiency of those lights, the nearest to our benefit, it, it encourages, it incentivizes, it cash flows innovation. And we own that product. So at the end, we're going to have to recycle and reuse that product, much as the healthcare industry has been doing and our imaging, medical imaging uh, brothers have been doing. They have been refurbishing and reusing these devices over and over. Now hospitals are asking not for the device itself, but for the output. They want to buy the image. So we move into what's called managed equipment services, and we provide imaging devices to hospital systems, and they use those devices, and when something new and better comes along, we replace it with that. We take out the old one, and we have to deal with what's left. And the best and most efficient way, and the best way to make money on that, is of course to refurbish it, recapture everything you can from that device, resell it, or reuse it in another location. So that, if you wouldn't mind going back a couple of slides, there, this is the model. We're, like I say, a global economy, also a member of the CE100. Been in business for 125 years. We don't view sustainability as a, a, a good idea. We, we just, that's just another word for innovation. And we look at the circular economy as a business imperative. 
That is the way our business will be in the future. That's the way we will survive as a business in the future. So thank you for your time. My business card's up here. Anybody that wants any more detailed information on it, I'll send you an electronic copy of, of either both a, an overview of the circular economy or a more detailed explanation of those topics we're discussing. John, John, thank you very much. Um, could you just talk to us a little bit about the relationship between business and government? Have you had to lead ahead of government, or has government helped you down this route of sort of transforming the business from products to, to services? Um, I believe some of the uh, opportunities have been created or have been driven by government policy. Certainly energy efficiency and, and much of the work that you have done, Congressman, has driven uh, governments as well as the private sector to use more energy efficient products. That results obviously in the adoption of LED lighting and that's the transformation we're talking about. Lighting that will last uh, a lifetime that will be one seventh, maybe one tenth the energy cost. So a lot of the energy efficiency programs, a lot of the uh, incentives that's, that governments create around energy efficiency and the requirements that we have and our goal frankly, in this country to seek energy independence all help drive uh, those innovations and that adoption of the LED, which is certainly uh, part of our business model as well. And um, Phillips is somewhat of a leader in this space. What do you attribute that to within your sector? It's primarily the uh, research and development, the innovation. We not only manufacture the best LED um, LED chips, we manufacture them for our competitors. Most of our competitors use our, our LEDs. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we've stayed on the cutting edge of that innovation that Dutch entrepreneurship uh, combined with a lot of the technology and innovation that we develop in R&D in this country have, have put us in a position to continue to, to be a leader, not just in our company, but um, in help other companies as well. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll move on. Oh. Laura Klaus, who is co-founder of um, at Better Future Factory, what a great name to be an for the organization, Better Future Factory. Um, I'm just going to pull one thing out of Laura's um, bio. She won the public vote for Dutch Engineer of the Year. The public vote, that's pretty impressive. Uh, maybe you'll tell us briefly how you did that, but Laura, either from there or from here, wherever you want to speak from, um, tell us about the Better Future Factory. Hi guys, nice that you are all here. Uh, I'm Laura Klaus, uh, co-founder and CTO of Better Future Factory. Uh, we are a design and engineering company based in the Netherlands, as you can hear, based in Rotterdam. Um, since a few years, I was inspired, or I can better say annoyed, by the amount of plastic we throw away every day. And at the same time, as an engineer, you're developing products from new plastic. But like, we have to do something about it, and I found a few like-minded engineers and we found a better future factory, and our goal was to add value to waste. Well, we are doing this for four years, and in these years, we found even more ways to add value to waste. Um, sometimes a picture tells more than a thousand words, so I will communicate a little bit with the mic to, so if you don't want to go to the next slide. If you ever been to a festival, you know it looked like this, in the end. And a lot of people, they just drink one second from a cup, throw it on the floor, and move on. We wanted to inspire people and create awareness about the plastic waste people, uh, problem. So we did it by combining waste with sexy technology like 3D printing. So we made an interactive recycling machine, which has hand-operated uh, machines to transform your cup into a 3D printed souvenir on the spot. We do it in four steps. Step one is cleaning and drying it. You here see a transparent tower. Uh, the second step is shredding it into little pieces by a hand-operated shredder. Then we put those little pieces in a hand-operated plastic extruder. It's the only one in the world, and uh, it works. And then <laughs> suddenly, we, uh, in the end, we put it in a 3D printer, and what you get is a ring made out of sentiment, out of the cup that you are just drinking with your hands. <laughs> and I see you thinking, what's the business model? How you can make money? We didn't know that in the beginning, but people wanted to rent our machine. So for the last four years, we have been in 11 countries recycling cups and waste on the spot. Um, we also noticed that like, 3D printing market is growing a lot, and there are no recycled filaments, no high quality recycled filaments. So 
So our second company was born, uh, Refill. We make high quality filaments from PET bottles, the transparent one and the blue one. Next slide. And also from the inside of refrigerators, which is an awesome material for 3D printing and from car dashboards. And after two years, clients of us saw that we were making money out of waste. So they approached us like, can you do this in Angola? We want to 3D print there. And we were like, they don't have so much uh, continuous power. So if you make 3D print, power stops, print fills. So we're not going to do it. We are like, good, but not crazy. We can make something different, something better. So we designed low-tech machines, um, which enables Angolan people to make plastic tiles who look like marble from their waste. And we didn't even make the machines. We also developed a business model uh, to tell them how they can sell it or to local hardware stores or to uh, their community. So we call it a business in a box and it, you can actually implement it in all like similar contexts, like developing economies. So to conclude, um, we are engineers. We like to do stuff and not only talk about policies. We make really small steps and then we show people what a circular economy really is. Not that it's a trend, but like waste is fuel for entrepreneurship. Thank you. Lara, thank you. That very inspiring, and I know you have some samples there to, to show people yeah. afterwards. Um, and also just to, to note you've travelled a long way to, to be here and participate in this today. So thank you for that. I was actually going to ask you about um, contrast in different parts of the world, which you've, you've answered um, by bringing in the example from Angola. And I think that's really important um, for us to understand that what works in even Europe might be different than what's going to work in America, let alone what's going to work in an emerging economy. So, so thank you for bringing that example out. Um, have you got anything you would want to add on the role of government and how that can help or hinder what you're trying to achieve in different parts of the world? Well, I think the government is already doing a good step at having targets and measurements, but um, they also want to prepare household waste. And what we see, because we are at events and uh, festivals, people who are not technical, sorry, they sometimes think plastic is one material. They don't even know you have different types, and they also don't understand why you should separate it. They think governments are making these rules to be annoying, or you know, to <laughs> point with the finger. And what we learn, if you show people, uh, sometimes we have uh, schools, and they want to work on recycling, and then they are like, can we combine plastics? And we say, try it. And then they say, ah, there are different melting temperatures, so you cannot combine it. And then suddenly the kids are going to teach the parents why it's important to separate. And I think one step, if you want like a, a clean one stream of plastic, is really valuable. As soon as it's mixed or dirty, your properties of your product are going to be so, so much worse. So I think to educate and to really tell people why they should do it, I think that's a really good step. Step. So invest in education or even in the States, you are doing or you, an amazing job. There are a lot of containers in the Starbucks, but nobody knows what to put in it. Uh, I take a look yesterday and like uh, some people put the cups and uh, uh, all together. So why not even make like do your um, white cups in this one? Uh, so you, people are trying, but it's not working. So I think make clear guidelines or pictures or tell them what to put in which container and why and you're uh, improving a lot. Laura, thank you very much. I know we can always rely on the Dutch to tell us bluntly what we're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. We need we need to be told. We need to be told. Um, but I think you've also I think Laura also brought out um, a dilemma that we are always going to have and that we need to navigate through for sustainability, which is um, the sort of the tension between making things as easy as possible for the consumer, single single stream recycling and that sort of thing, um, as opposed to educating the consumer to, to do things differently. And that's a dilemma that I think we need to be aware of or attention and, and navigate our way through. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for staying pretty much to time and 
I, I know your passion, this is all of your passion, you put your lives into this, and to shrink it into four minutes is really tough. But we have about 20 minutes left for questions. I've had a chance to ask a few. I'm going to open up to the floor. I'm going to ask you if you'll keep your questions short, and if you'll also just say who you are and who you're representing. If you want to ask a particular person a question, say so. If you just want to open it to the panel, um, that's great as well. Any questions from the floor for our panelists? just going to repeat the question because I don't know if everybody at the back can hear. The question was about the importance of developing an infrastructure um, to allow these different circular economy models. Maybe I can also address the question uh, regarding Nesco. Uh, we recycle the ash, and as you can imagine, the logistical cost for such volumes and weights is tremendous. So you would like not to move it at all. So we tend to operate within the flow. That could be at the waste to energy facility, it could be at a transfer station of an ash handler or recycler, or it could be at the end destination at a landfill. So we operate in the flow. But what I really like also with the Philips concept is the service approach, and that's the direction we're taking. We're not talking just about metals, but we believe that society in the future will demand a full service approach on ash. So let us deal with your ash, so you're compliant with the law, you will get the revenues, and we take care of the business, we have the knowledge. So um, that's definitely also uh, on our target list. Just so the easiest thing for us is to tap into existing commercial composters. But the really interesting technology is on site at aged care and childcare centres, rapid composting technology. So it's units that get up to 65 degrees centigrade and can compost food waste, diapers and wipes in a 24 hour period. And it reduces the volume by 80%. So then you're just trucking less stuff. Because they are a lot of things. We are like merchandise, you are uh, 
come collecting points, you are kids entertainment. So that are like a lot of assets that you can raise the price. And then we got like money coming in of the company and we used that money to fund our other projects. So we didn't have external finance, we just did it by our own uh, yeah, revenue. I'll be brief, but that's an issue that we face as well, a large company yeah, as yeah, well. Sorry, uh, that's no, that's what was going to be that, but obviously this is an issue. That, uh, the deal we did with WMATA, we internally financed it. Uh, and, and as an individual, I learned a long time ago, it's easy to get a loan if you don't need the money. Uh, <laughs> we had the money and we made it happen, and since then several uh, lenders have tried to take it off our hands for us. So uh, once you get it going and boot it up, even on a large scale, it's John, thanks, and I know Eunice here is, um, yeah, I think, perhaps a con con contrasting yeah. answer as well. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to give a perspective as well. You know, in the, in the whole uh, spectrum of, of our sustainability strategy, where circular economy is one of our tools in the toolkit, uh, we are also, for, for the most part, over the course of the past you know, 20 years of our journey, we've been internally funded, so one billion uh, in terms of investment. But we save five billion, so that five billion goes into the reinvestment of further innovation, whether it's for operations or for, for various markets and value chains. Um, but then when we refer back to the Green Deal, uh, this is just one example of a few that we have, whereas you partner with the local government that is going to be putting up quite a bit of funds in order to enable that transition to a circular economy that requires you know, cross-collaboration in terms of various parts of the value chain that otherwise probably would not engage with one another. So with that investment, and then you're having significant reduction of transportation of, of materials across highways, et cetera, that would normally um, you know, really be a, a major cost driver for many, many companies, that is, that is significant. So uh, we're internally funded, but then where we need to um, and where we can use other people's money, you know, and, and work with, uh, from a partnership with the governments, that is uh, going to be the key as we continue to move forward. Luigi, I'm just going to say, um, from working with a range of companies on all sorts of sustainability issues, in, including circular economy, the, the, the challenge I most often see is a challenge of timescales, of whether the market is here now, or are we willing to make that bet a little ahead of the market, which is what I think all of the companies here have done, um, and persuading your organization to do that. I don't know if we've answered the question. Did anybody else want to add anything else to? Yeah, I'm just going to talk about this. Um, um, so we, we were 11 years old, and we started very traditionally fundraising-wise. We maxed out our credit cards, we moved to America, we got working visas, um, we got angel investor, we got VC, and a VC, they're a five to seven year and they're done. They've got to go, and that's how their model works. So we ended up buying out our VC, buying out our angels, and now we're self-funded. And uh, to your point, uh, the timelines are all skewing. Like, that VC model demands um, growth forever and, a, and an acquirer sitting right there, but in the, and that's very linear. And in the circular economy, we find partnerships are critical. So in the Norman Carpet Foundation, the relationship for us with, say, Suez, the biggest uh, falling company in the world, is critical. And the, how value is ascribed is slightly different. For us, it's sort of the same. We, we funded ourselves and we control our own destiny, and we can control the, the timeline. You know, investors might not like that we're not in the US, the US investors. Jason, thank you. Uh, thanks. My question is slightly an extension of the last one, but I'm wondering if you can talk about um, reporting, integrated reporting, um, and this is probably best for publicly traded companies. Um, but um, so ESG, PRI. Are you safe who you're from? Oh, I'm, I'm in urban planning. Okay, very good. Thank only you. with Tara. Um, um, yeah, but actually, I'm yeah. just fascinated with sort of ESG, PRI stuff, environmental, social governance. Um, Accounting standards um, and how you're actually uh, looking at performance metrics, um, either internally from the CSR side or if you have specific um, uh, shareholders that are demanding um, this question of materiality, what material, constitutes material risk in your um, business model. Okay. And I'm just going to say, uh, to avoid this getting too specialist for the sustainability audience, who probably understood a lot of that language, but others might not, we can keep this, the answer to within the circular economy piece as much as possible. I'm particularly interested in the component of the question about in, are investors demanding this? Uh, well, okay, so we, we, I, I will have to touch on the sustainability part, right? Because 
Um, we just released our 2015 report on sustainability in which everything is embedded in there. So when we take a look at the connection of um, uh, the reporting that we do from sustainability, all the metrics there, how that aligns to the growth of the company, uh, the various elements that uh, investors are looking for in terms of are we making money, are we investing in, in various parts of the world, um, are we investing in those areas where uh, there are, you know, the, the world leading challenges, whether it's water, energy, et cetera, and it's all, it's an integrated report, uh, but of course we do still have our separate end report for the company. Uh, we do have a, the integration of what the company reports to, to Wall Street embedded into our sustainability reporting. And circle economy is still new for now in terms of reporting, but that will be a part of our ongoing reporting for uh, the key metrics that we have across our seven goals. Maybe uh, I can uh, briefly uh, elaborate on the topic because uh, transparency in a financial sense, but also in a sustainable sense, I think is key. If we as UNESCO want to move uh, forward as we are doing as being a one-stop service uh, provider for owners of ash, you also have to be very transparent. What did you process? What were the residues? Where did it end up? And how much uh, sustainable benefit did you create on a CO2 level or on a, on a landfill reduction? So transparency is key. It comes with education and transparency will be yeah, uh, absolutely essential for the future when you want to provide these services. <clears throat> Pretty much the same as Dow, the, the difference I think being that as a Dutch company, uh, we were culturally inclined or, or I guess it was embedded uh, to begin with. The whole notion uh, of not just the transparency, but the sustainability of our, of our business model. Uh, when your country is you know, more than 50% below sea level, you, you have a different worldview on a lot of these issues. And uh, that's just a part of our culture. So we also have the reporting embedded in our, our annual report. We have the special report. Um, the, the investors, though, are not a, a, a driver. I think they're, they're driven by the outcomes. And I think early on recognized in our particular industry that we had to transform from a manufacturing to a service-based uh, uh, business. And as a result, uh, it was very obvious to them that the circular economy and that model was the appropriate model. John, thank you. Let me open back up to the floor. And also, if there's anybody from a company who'd like to share any additional experiences, either um, that, that bring a different perspective or, or re reinforce something we've already heard, that would be great to hear. And um, Chris. Yeah, so Chris Holden from Globescan. Um, so this is a really interesting new industrial revolution, B2B conversation broadly. But, but what are your instincts or experiences related to the, the hook for consumers? Where do, where do consumers get excited around this conversation? And can they be brought into it or not? We, um, so what we found is um, uh, we're actually trialing that B2B product in a B2C way. But it's a little awkward, right? Because we can't offer them that end back-end solution. We're not collecting from households. But what we're finding is uh, mums are engage with the product and then they actually help us get the product into their childcare centers. So it's an interesting reverse engagement where we have this, this passion brand that they want to champion the product and take it into their childcare centers, which from a scale standpoint, that we are point, the scale is very quick. You think of the largest childcare center in America is Knowledge Universe, that's 1600 centers, started by the wonderful Michael Milken, after a little stick in jail. Um, you know, that's scale, you think about 1600. And so the, from a consumer standpoint, it's, it's very compelling, and it's very compelling because the price point is right there. And you can really grab every one of those 12 million babies in diapers in the US compared to today where a lot of eco-friendly diaper options are just premium. So you only get, you get the whole foods market, market and not been whole food shoppers, but that's not the whole world. <laughs> I guess the, the best example that I have uh, is related to our packaging business. Uh, we piloted uh, last year with Citrus Heights in California uh, an energy bag project. And the, the whole point of that project was to, number one, uh, begin to educate the consumer with regards to what can be recycled, because most consumers don't know, as we heard from Laura, they don't know what to recycle or how to, you know, what, what should they do. Um, so a key component of that was education, but another component of that was to really be able to capture 
the energy that's embedded in, in packaging that would otherwise go to landfill. So we, we were able to divert packaging from landfill, educate the consumer, and then also, um, you know, we, we were able to uh, get synthetic crude oil straight back out of the, the, the products that were uh, recaptured from, uh, from the recycling of the consumers. And I, I'd say the exciting part about it is after that pilot was done, we were actually on over to a much larger pilot in other cities, um, is that after that pilot was done, the, the, the consumers were like, oh, well, why, why can't we continue it? Why can't we, you know, this, 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 and we said, well, this is a way now you know that you can recycle. So unfortunately, it's very local specific. It's very intensive in terms of consumer education. Uh, but we found with that example, once we get them excited and understand, you know, how things can be done differently, then they, they grab a hold of it. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. It wasn't just Dow, because we're very far upstream. And Larry, you've seen that same end, I think, from downstream, by the, in fields at festivals and out in yeah. Angola. Like making stuff sexy or awesome, that's, um, you guys call him Joe Sixpack, I believe. <laughs> uh, Joe Sixpack loves to drink beer and loves to destroy stuff. <laughs> and what we do, uh, we recycle cups, you can destroy it yourself, it makes noise. And then you have to make an awesome 3D print, which you can give to your wife or your girlfriend. So we actually are renting uh, or like, uh, for a motocross festival. And then you can all do that with the recycling. But they really like it so much that your waste is a new souvenir that those guys are really hiring our service. And for the Angolan people, like I told you, they don't care about the environment. They have more stuff to worry about. But they care about making money. And that's what we are focusing there. Guys, if you do this low tech machines, you can make this much stuff as you need by just getting like a PET box there laying next to your house or next to your school. And then you don't even have to convince them. So our project all starts with user research, like user research as resource. That if you combine them smart, then I think it's almost a success for a good economy. People are always talking about adding value to the material, but we believe that it's all it's the people who have to do it. So you really have to think about okay, so we think they're going to recycle for the environment, no, of course not, but if they can sell it, they will. So if you make sure every stakeholder in step has a nice uh, yeah, rewards, then it probably will be uh, okay. Lara, thank you. I, I'm not sure my gender advisor back at WRI would, would like the characterization that women buy diapers and men crush beer cans. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the reality. Maybe that's yeah. the reality you're seeing. I'm actually going to ask John, who, John, you actually said your business model has been working for business to business, this changing light from a product into a service, but it's not so easy, I, I mean, my words rather than yours, specifically for, for consumers. Is there a way to crack that consumer market for you as well? Not quite figure that out on the lighting side. Um, people are used to paying for their electricity, and that's where their lights come from. So that's, that's going to be, and, and, and the utility, until the utility model utility of the future model shakes out in this country, it will be very difficult for us to define how we would go to market there. Uh, right now, the utility uh, stands between us and the consumer uh, in that respect, because if we're essentially paying for their electricity and selling light at the end of the day. In the healthcare, the model would be uh, a little different on, on, cons on personal consumer products, it's entirely possible. But again, on the large medical imaging, that is something that's managed by your healthcare provider, and that is the ultimate consumer there. Not the user necessarily, but the consumer. Yep, maybe a brief elaboration. I uh, would like to tell you about a very positive example here in the US, which I saw about two months ago in Florida. There's a new waste to energy facility uh, built. It's operational, I think, since the beginning of this year. It's the West Palm Beach, Florida uh, plant. And anybody judging waste to energy in a positive way or a negative way, go there. See how much they invest into recycling with the educated people. So uh, landfills and waste to energy plants are not the common uh, adventure you would take your family to in a weekend. But going to such a plant is fabulous. You will see that the people over there have, like you, uh, a common goal of, of creating a healthy future for our kids. So uh, education is key. And what West Palm Beach has done is fabulous. And I believe that after this first initial phase where we try to reap low-hanging fruits of metal uh, revenue, there will be the mineral flow 
and people will demand sustainable buildings, which were not mined from quarries, but were from recycled products, not just the solar panels, but also the concrete blocks. Thank you very much. One last question. Um, mine's kind of focused here. Uh, John, following up on... Oh, Michael Nix, I'm an energy consultant here in town. John, following up on yours. Um, been using your product for 25 years. Part of the way I started using it was was working for a company out of Wisconsin. We would pay people to use CFLs over uh, other types of lighting. All right, we would pay people to uh, use the higher level of energy efficiency on the air conditioning systems. So they would buy Philips light bulbs for back then maybe seven dollars for a CFL, but we'd give them like a two or three dollar rebate. And then it was a big thing for us to work at the state level in Madison and out here in federal to get favorable tax treatment for this. But we, uh, I did this with my building. It's about a 200 unit uh, condominium building, DuPont Circle, about 150,000 square feet. We put in Phillips light bulbs throughout the building about 11 years ago. Our electricity rates went down 35%. Uh, most the, most of those light, lights are still there. We've now redone the parking garage. Is this is this your ringer in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> you would think. No, you would no, think. No, 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 we, we, we are we are on the past time. And, and, and then uh, uh, there, there's one one particular question to you: How much of Philips manufacturing now is uh, CFLs, and how much have you switched over to LED lighting? The, the future is LED or right. OLED, organic LED. There will be a time when the lighting in this room will emanate from the wall or from the roof. There will not even be a light fixture. So, of course, if you're making light fixtures, that doesn't look good. But, uh, but LED is the future. We still have the world's most advanced, sophisticated uh, fluorescent facility in Kansas, and there's still a big demand for that. But it is, the, the numbers are it just astounding and it's much faster than any of us predicted. The adoption of LED is accelerating. Uh, you, you know, Congress tried to, to save the incandescent light bulb. It's going to die. <laughs> it's, it's probably dead. They just don't know. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen again. We're not going to, it's like buggy place. Yep. Okay. John, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to thank everybody in our panel. Laura Krauss and Betty Peter Bassley. John from Jason most welcome from the National and Eunice East from Dow. Thank you all very much. And um, Bart's going to have our last word. Yeah, somebody needs to thank you, uh, Kevin. So that's what I'm going to do. And somebody needs to thank the audience. We were really thrilled with the, uh, with the turnout today. So it was a very great uh, event like this. It's only a success if you have uh, an audience as well. Uh, before I hand out the presence, uh, as a token of appreciation to the panelists and also to you, Kevin, there's one person I'd like to thank in particular, Wilhelmine Floss, who has been working very hard to make this work. Okay, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.